Hello, I'm FTX Soycat, and Minecraft is a game which has many complexities to it. I'm sure this goes without saying, but there are many things that you can learn fairly quickly in Minecraft, but there are many other things that might take months or even years to learn. And I figured, given that many people might not know these things, and lots of people are just getting into the game for the very first time, it'd be useful to go through some of the weird quirks that Minecraft has that take some time to work out naturally, but that I can give you the cheat sheet for and teach you with today's video. So here are 42 things you need to know about the game. We're going to mix things up by starting with 21 things that you actually should do and then having 21 things that you really shouldn't do so you know both the things that will help you out a lot and the things that will help you out to not do a lot. So with that said, let's dive straight into the first thing you should know because the number one most searched thing about Minecraft always ends up being how do you find diamonds? And it's funny because all of the common advice that people share amongst themselves is always at least slightly wrong. There are so many like memes about the best way to find diamonds that are never perfectly accurate and this is because most people just assume you go below ground to find diamonds. And if you know a little bit more, you might be like, well, you don't just go below ground, you've got to go below Y15. That's right, diamonds are only found below Y15, but then the advice beyond that gets a little bit tricky. Because technically right now, here in the destroyed chunk, while I'm at Y equals 3, I'm technically below Y equals 15, but it's still not the best place for me to find diamonds. If I start mining, I might eventually find diamonds, it's entirely possible, but that doesn't mean this is a great place to go to find diamonds. But instead, what you want to do is you want to go up a few layers, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, Y equals 3 or something like that, to either Y equals 5, which has some of the best diamond results, or Y equals 11. If I show you this graph on screen right now, it shows the distribution of diamond ore by layer. As you can see, it only starts at Y15, but there aren't many at 15, and there also aren't many at the very base layer of bedrock. You want to go somewhere in between those numbers. Again, a lot of people say a lot of different things, but 11 and 5 are the two things you need to know that have the most diamonds. So when someone says, oh no, it's Y equals 13, bro, it's Y equals 7, bro, just know uh, that one, they're saying bro far too often while talking about Minecraft diamonds, and two, you need to know that you don't go to either of those layers, 5 or 11, or in fact what I recommend is both, mine down here at 5, do your branch mining technique, and then also mine at Y11. By the way, a thing that I should mention, because you're going to need to know this if you want to dig at Y equals 5 or Y equals 11, is how do you find your Y value? It's really easy on bedrock because it's the middle value of the coordinates in the top left of the screen, and obviously you can press F3 on Java if you want to, but the easiest way to find out without having to have either of those things enabled is to find the bedrock layer where you can stand consistently on the ground because you can't you know you can dig below y equals 3 but this is where you can't dig below some bits of the bedrock find this layer and that's y equals 3 so you dig up two blocks from here so go up a little bit then go up another block to find y equals 5 and again you can just do this exact same counting thing to work it out from anywhere else if you really want to if you want to work it from the surface bear in mind most minecraft service is roughly 64 uh you know the water level is roughly at that point too so yeah if you want to dig down from water you can do it that way but I, what, what I recommend is just dig all the way down to bedrock and then dig up a few blocks and then know that this is always where it was five and this is where the diamonds are found. So a thing you definitely shouldn't do in Minecraft, and again, this is a common piece of advice, uh, but it's always just given with the advice of don't dig straight down. And I agree, don't just dig straight down like this. This is a dangerous thing to do, and you might, you're might you not always going to pay the consequences, but when you do, you'll fall in lava, and you can lose all of your stuff. So what I instead recommend doing is stand between two blocks. The cool thing about Minecraft is there is a space where you're technically standing, or standing on both blocks, which means if you remove one of them, you can still stand on the other one. Meaning if there is lava down there, we wouldn't fall into it because we can see what's down there. Okay, here's a cave, for example. We know we don't have to fall into that cave, and if that cave was a lava pool instead, we wouldn't fall into it, although I did just fall into it. But you get the point. You can dig down, and you can guarantee you won't fall into a lava pit by always digging two blocks at the same time, or if you really want to be meticulous, you can dig four blocks at the same time, because again, Minecraft blocks, you can stand at the edge of them by not really standing on them, which means that, yeah, fun fact, you can stand on four blocks at once if you want to. Next up, I have a tip that's really going to help you out if you are a survival player, because most Minecraft players seem to know that you can pick block in creative. I, I can look at a block of stone, and I can press the middle mouse button, or whatever other button, to pick block, and then I can have stone in my inventory. But you might not know that you can do that in survival, because as you can see right here, I'm in survival, but yet I grab myself a whole stack of stone. If I use all of this stack of stone somewhere, you can notice how I can then move that away, and then I can grab another one by doing the exact same thing, because you can 
can pick block in survival. The reason a lot of people don't know this is because one, again, like it seems like a creative feature, like it's, it was fairly recently added to survival, and by recently I mean a few years ago, um, so a lot of people don't know that, and second of all, it's not bound to your controller by default in Minecraft Bedrock. That's right, if you play with a controller, as you would on a console, uh, then what you're actually going to need to do is find the pick block item key, which again is by default not bound, and put it onto something. I recommend up on the d-pad, but you can put it on anything you want, including right stick down, including literally A if you want to be crazy and ignore your jump button. You can put it on anything you like, and isn't that wonderful? Next up, I have another tip for what you can do with that stone if you choose to place it. By the way, I just got hit by a skeleton and the arrow went through the fire, which means it lights me on fire too. So fun fact, here's a thing you might not know is possible in Minecraft, and usually isn't if you don't have a Neverack uh, fence around your house. Anyway, so if you want to make stairs or you know slabs using those uh, you know stone blocks you got, you might think that's a great idea. And for stone slabs, sure, use a crafting table all the time. I'm just going to go to a different crafting table. However, if you want to make stairs, the classic six block of your choice in a little staircase pattern to make four stairs is not actually the best way to do this. And it might not matter if you're literally making four or you're making just a few of these stairs, it might be more worthwhile just to keep doing this anyway. However, if you are making anything more than that, in the village and pillage update, a brand new item was added. I say brand new, it was arguably added many, many years ago, but it added a new uh, use for the stone cutter, which means you can take that same stack of stone and you can craft it into stone stairs at a one to one ratio. So instead of getting four stairs for every six stone you put in, every, you know, like stone you put in turns into one of these. So we're going to take six stone and turn it into six stairs, which I will uh, do the maths for you. It's very complex. So I'll show you the working out on screen. Four is less than six by two, in fact. So you get 150% more stairs when you use a stone cutter. So if you're using any, if you're making any significant number of stairs or walls or anything like that, use a stone cutter. Pro tip. So yeah, make sure you don't craft stone stairs at a crafting table unless you absolutely have to, but make sure you do go looking in plains biomes if you're looking for any form of mob. Uh, a surprisingly unknown fact is the fact that plains biomes in Minecraft are the place where most mobs will spawn. Do you want chickens? Do you want sheep? Do you want pigs? Do you want cows? Uh, you know, alongside it, you get the feathers, you get the eggs, you get the wool, you get the leather, and you get meat, which is very crucial if you want to survive in Minecraft, assuming you're not doing a veganism run, of course. But if you want all of these things, you need to come to a plains biome. What does a plains biome look like? Well, it looks like a plains in real life, which if you don't know, is pretty flat, mostly green, has very, very green grass, and you're going to find a lot of mobs here. As you can see, there's two cows over there already, there's a few sheep over there. All of the mobs you want, you're going to find here. So if you want to start a sheep farm, or if you just want to have somewhere to sleep for the night, which requires a uh, wolf, sadly, then these are the guys you're going to need, and the only way you're going to get them is inside of a plains biome. However, you want to make sure you don't come here at night time, and the reason for that is because mobs won't spawn, or at least the friendly mobs you're looking for, and instead all of the hostile mobs that you're definitely not looking for will spawn instead. And although it's worth coming back here if you came here in the day, so you can pick up the mobs you didn't kill if you are desperate, it's worth noting all of the mobs that you want to avoid, zombies, skeletons, creepers, will spawn here at night. That's assuming you do want to avoid them. If you're looking for them, uh, then plains biomes and deserts are the two best for finding them, assuming you haven't lit yours up with torches, that is. But both of these biomes are very flat and very filled with mobs because of that. Or at least, it's the same number of mobs, but you're more likely to see one, which means that, effectively, you can just think of it as you will find more mobs in a desert and in a plains biome. Assuming you can't find yourself a plains or a savanna biome, which has much of the same benefits, but you really want some food and you really don't want to eat that plant-based stuff, then what you can do is find yourself a river. This is, uh, you know, rivers are a great place to find yourself. Lots of spawning salmon, which are a great food once you cook them up. And they're an okay food if you don't cook them up. So yeah, go swimming in one of these rivers and within no time at all. Like right here alone, you can see there's free salmon, which fun fact, come in slightly different sizes. That might be a better off exclusive, but still, you can find some salmon. It's a great food. You can sometimes even find some cod, sometimes even some tropical fish and some puffer fish. But really, salmon's the one you want if you want food. However, while you're here, make sure you don't uh, you know, like, <laughs> go into the river without carefully looking first. One of Minecraft's most dangerous, and let's be honest, just annoying mobs, is found underwater and can wreck you seriously early game. If you're at the stage where you need food, uh, you need meat, you need stuff like that, then you're going to be ex especially susceptible to drowns with tridents. You can spot drowns underwater pretty easily because their faces do glow. And if you see any drowns with a trident, just know they can attack you from a lot further than you can attack them from. And you're going to die if you don't spot them in time. 
And just in case you don't believe me, and you don't believe the woes of the Minecraft community when it comes to dry drowns of tridents, let me show you how much damage one can do to you on hard difficulty without any armor on. As you can see, he's gonna hit me, and he's gonna almost immediately kill me. Had there been a second round of a trident, or had he just hit his second trident very fast after, he would have killed me. And although it's kind of annoying that drowns have unlimited tridents to throw, I mean like, it's it's the sort of thing you're meant to be able to throw once and be done with for normal players, it's still very interesting regardless. Let's talk about the single best source of smelting fuel in the game, because it is available here, not just by the bucket load, which is how you're going to want to get it by the way, buckets of lava, but it's available by the ocean load. There are millions of blocks of lava just within a few, you know, blocks of the spot of your portal there are trillions upon trillions upon trillions of blocks of lava and every individual one of these buckets of lava is going to be the equivalent of a hundred smelts in minecraft the best for any individual fuel you can find in the game meaning that if you want to smelt a lot of things you know one stack sure use cold if you want so smelting a hundred stacks well you're gonna need some lava buckets which is why the automatic smelters that I have set up here, so, uh, you know, to make glass, which I need to fix the end, the reason they use lava buckets is because they're the most efficient fuel, so you can just take a few lava buckets and smelt a lot of sand. Now you know. When it comes to lava, you might assume it's the same in every dimension, but the truth is lava works very different inside the nether, and it can catch you off guard, because, uh, you know, lava is not only found in these huge pits right here, but it's also found randomly when you dig through the walls, and when you do randomly find it, You'll notice how it flows much, much, much faster, and it can also flow much, much, much further, so it's something you really have to keep your eye out for, because water, uh, lava in the nether flows just about as fast and as far as water does in the overworld, which means insane things like this are possible, where lava can fill up entire caverns and cover entire sections of the nether because you're not careful. And oh no, we've done it again. And yeah, you really have to always be on the lookout for lava when mining in the nether. This might be uh, possible to use in some way but it's very dangerous regardless. Even then, as I was talking about it, I almost made a mistake. So we all know about the downsides of lava. We can all see a pit of lava and say, hey, that's dangerous. And hopefully now you can look at a pit of never lava and say it's dangerous. But the truth is it is a very valuable block. And that's why finding it in a speedrun or just in any Minecraft survival world is incredibly useful. And the reason for that is because if you place down a water bucket and then immediately place down a lava bucket, you can make obsidian. This is really handy because you can make obsidian without having to mine it. A lot of people think you need a diamond pickaxe to make an ever portal, but guess what? That's entirely false. All you need is a a lot of water buckets and a lot of lava buckets or just a big source of lava like a lava pit and then you need some water and you can make yourself a net portal from scratch just like this it's really handy it's really convenient and it's a really fun way to save yourself a lot of time if you don't want to mine for diamonds because you know even the, th uh, the tip i mentioned earlier it's still going to take some serious time to find diamonds and maybe you don't like mining in minecraft maybe you think oh yeah it with the current uh, you know like uh, you know caves which haven't been updated in a while by the way but with the current lack of cave update what's even the point in mining and i agree with you so what you can do instead is you can go straight to the nether if you choose to. However, if you're going to make a nether portal via the traditional means or via the water and lava bucket technique, make sure you don't place it too low down. Uh, placing it on top of a mountain might be too high up, but don't place it below sea level. Don't place it in a cave where you find a lava pit naturally, because if you place down a nether portal really low, the odds are you're going to spawn into the nether quite low down, which is not what you want because you might spawn below one of those giant lava pits. It's a pain to get out of and you just, you just don't want to do it. Long Next up, we have the tip regarding saddles, horse armor, and name tags, because they can only be found in rare chests that naturally generate. You can also trade some of them from villagers, but to keep things simple, they're found in rare chests, which includes finding things under the sea, in nether fortress, end cities, and of course, dungeons just like this. This is an empty chest, but it could contain horse armor and name tags and, uh, you know, saddles and all these other rare things that you're going to want if you want to do the fun, goofy things I'm sure you've seen in YouTube videos. So yeah, bear in mind, those are the places you're going to find them. However, if you are in a dungeon finding a chest with all these rare things, you're also going to find a mob spawner block. These mob spawner blocks are really valuable, so don't ignore them no matter what you do. Make sure you torch them up and save the location if you want to use it for later. Or, to go into our next little handy tip, you can mine a mob spawner and you get a surprising amount of experience. They're one of the biggest single source of experience in Minecraft. Mine one of these and you'll get a little bit of an experience boost, which is really handy at this stage of the game. Yeah, either turn it into a mob farm like I've done uh, multiple times before, as you can see that. There's a lot of uh, easy, there's a lot of trick designs, but basically you want to have all your mobs go into one area. Here's an example of how to do that. And uh, you can do either that or you can mine it. Either way, you can get a lot of experience from these blocks. Never leave them behind because you don't get experience from leaving things behind. Next up, we have the fact that you don't have to put up with rain. It's terrible. No one likes rain. 
It's got an annoying visual appearance. It cuts down your render distance, which on Realms is already very low. Um, there's a lot of downsides to rain, so how do you get rid of it? You go to sleep. Go to sleep in Minecraft. It's important, you know, like, do it for lots of reasons. But one of the best reasons is to skip forwards through rain, which you should always be doing at any point in time. Even if it's multiplayer, you should immediately be, be saying, hey, how about we stop sleeping? How about we start sleeping? So we can bring our render distance back, which you can see is slowly happening right now. This is a bedrock exclusive. On Java, it doesn't cut down your render distance. Just keep that in mind before we move into the next tip, which is to do with the end. So once you've defeated the Ender Dragon and you head out to these end islands, you might be curious as to what actually is going on out here. What is the point in defeating the Ender Dragon? What's the point in going to this dimension in the first place? Because a lot of players, even who watch my videos, have never done that because it's just a lot of effort for not really much reward, right? But no, once you get out to the end island, which are about a thousand blocks away from the main end thing, which you can go to through a uh, you know little end gateway. Um, once you go out there, you're going to find these rare structures. They're called end cities. So end cities are somewhat rare and have about a 50% chance of coming with an end ship. Those end ships have a 100% chance of containing an elixir, which is how, in case you're curious, I fly all the time. So it's worth mentioning that by default, these Elytra wings that you can equip are only going to allow you to glide, which is still an amazing ability in Minecraft, but you're going to run out of gliding space real fast because it means if you try to go up, you're going to run out of momentum. So that's where fireworks come in because firework rockets can be crafted with just a simple paper and then a gunpowder. It's quite a simple recipe, actually. But by crafting fireworks, you can give yourself momentum to fly up into the sky and then to glide for much, much longer, which is how I do it in most of my videos. So how do you fly? You can pick block in Survival Minecraft, but you can also fly in Survival Minecraft. If you master Survival Minecraft enough, I mean, arguably, you've got all the benefits that you could want from creative. If you do make your way to an end city, make sure you don't panic if you're hit by one of these shulkers. Shulkers are actually one of the more harmless mobs in the game, except for their attacks, which can cause mass panic. And if you panic, then this can get so much worse. Because Floating up can kill you almost instantly. However, always float towards the building and you can see two and a half hearts. It's bad, but it's not catastrophic bad. Otherwise, if you let one of these things hit you and you just float out into the abyss, this is a big enough ball to kill me. So get to where it's not going to kill you if you don't want to die. I mean, like, I guess that goes for most forms of death. If you don't want to die, get away from the thing that's trying to kill you. And even sometimes it's smarter to let yourself be hit again so you can get up to somewhere else, like right up here, and then you're full and you won't even necessarily take full damage just like that. I actually use the shocker attack as a positive. It's one of the few enemies where they have one attack and that one attack is often a positive thing. And that's what I like about shulkers. They're terrifying if you're not used to them. But just again, remember, they're pretty much harmless after these things have gone. You can, you can attack them and kill them quite easily. And uh, also... Flying is not a bad thing. It's actually the whole reason you come to these end cities. By the way, if you are flying around the end, and especially if you've got a low render distance and you can't see what's what, you might forget that you could go below y equals zero. And if you do, as you can see right here, you're going to start taking damage because this is technically the void. So make sure you have fireworks to get out of there, assuming you don't want to die. If you are going to use firework rockets to boost your Elytra, make sure they're just plain firework rockets. They should just say, Flight, you know, like a firework rocket underneath it. If it says anything like star-shaped red, if it says flight duration, if it says any of these things, then you've got a generally pretty good sign that this is going to be a bad firework. These will actually hurt you if you use them. So just to show you, here's me using this firework right here. And when it explodes, it makes a cool star, but it also hurts you from behind. So unless you're doing a fireworks display where you fly around and do the fireworks, which is actually a cool idea, make sure whatever you do, you don't use fireworks with tips on the top. You just use regular old firework rockets because you care more about the rocket part than the firework part. Or at least you should. 99.9% .9 of the time when you're not doing firework displays for your friends. Speaking of things you can do when you're not doing firework displays for your friends, uh, the Elytra is not just useful because you can fly around. You can also use it to avoid full damage, as I attempted on that fateful day uh, many months ago now. <laughs> So assuming you do have your Elytra equipped, which you should always be checking, of course, uh, you can actually avoid full damage because if you start falling, you can just turn it into a glide. And that way, when you hit the ground, you're not going to take any full damage. So, uh, yeah, obviously it works better with higher falls because you have more time to spot it. But even for pretty minor falls, let's say from the top of this staircase to the bottom, if you run all the way from the top to the bottom, you're going to take full damage because anything more than, uh, you know, four block fall is going to be full damage related. However, if you use an Elytra, you can glide and make it nothing, which is really useful. 
Just make sure you don't collide with the floor too fast or it isn't useful because it still counts as falling because it's based on your momentum. If you fall below the speed of gravity, then you'll take damage. Also, if you fire into a wall really fast, then it, the same thing's going to happen on Java. I was like, there is a way to make it happen on Bedrock, but it's so specific. I think there's like a bug where you don't take full damage. So the next useful tip for you here is to do with Never Portal. So the Never is linked at an 8 to 1 ratio with the Overworld. And if two portals are placed within 128 blocks of each other, uh, you know, inside of the Never, then they'll link to the same place. And the same is true in the inverse for the Overworld. So if they would link within 128 blocks of each other, they don't link to each other. They link to the same place. And uh, in case you're curious, it's like, that's a lot of words you said, Toy Cat. That doesn't really help me. Well, you can use this to have instantly linking places in the Overworld world via the never. Let's say I want to teleport to that portal right there instantly. Again, you could go through the never from quite far away, but even from over here, which is quite close, as long as you're in 512 blocks, you can make a brand new never portal like we're going to do. And then when we step through it, we're going to end up in the same point in the never as that portal takes you to. Meaning if we step through this portal, we'll end up right over there in the predicted place. Then if we go right back through that portal, we'll end up in the place just outside the church of the, uh, the wither. So as you can see, just like this, we've ended up over there instantly. I say instantly, I mean it's no walking required. It takes about 10 seconds to do, but you can do this for much further distances than say there to there, which could probably be walked in the map at the same time, but you can do it from much further distances as long as it's within 512 blocks of one another and they won't make a new portal in the nether. So yeah, you can do crazy far distances if you want. To give an example, back there is my same, uh, you know, two portals. If I wanna go to there all the way from my barrel, which stores all my different items as well as my maps, which is a work in progress, by the way. But if you want to store, uh, you know, like, uh, if, if you want to go from there to here really quickly, I don't know what I'm trying to do here. But if you want to uh, connect two points, you can do the exact same thing. I put corners on my portal because I'm kind of a big deal. Kind of pretty Minecraft wealthy. But yeah, we can do the exact same thing from all the way over here, uh, over 100 blocks away, or 200, or over 300 blocks away, linked to the exact same portal. And then from this exact same portal, go back through the never, and boom, instantly there. Although it instantly takes 10 seconds because never portals aren't instant. But in a dream world in the future where never portals have better performance. Oh, we've done the opposite now. Again, sometimes you have issues where portals link to each other, especially of older worlds. So now we can do the inverse of what I was just saying. This portal over there will take us to that portal over there instantly. So let me show you how that works. Wow, look, I go inside the nether portal. I wait for Minecraft to do its magic where it takes a few seconds to load in. And then we go right back through the portal, wait for the few seconds of magic. And all of a sudden I've gone from my wither church to my big barrel room. It's weird that that happens sometimes, but if you have an older world, it's kind of just part of the course. Also, there's a lot of maps to fill in. I know. Oh wait, plug, plug, plug. If you subscribe to the channel, you'll see that as it slowly gets done. You want to see a giant map slowly get filled in? Well, that's the thing you can see over on this channel, but only if you subscribe. I mean, actually, if you don't subscribe, realistically, there's a chance YouTube shows it to you anyway. But, you know, subscribing boosts my ego, and here's a mid-roll video ad for you to do, go do that. By the way, if you do have a nev portal in an area where you also keep animals or also just animals spawn and that you care about in any way, make sure that the animals don't go through the nev portal. It's really easy, as I can show you right now. In fact, it's easier for a chicken to go to the nether than it is for you. To show you that this is true, because it sounds like a pretty bold claim, let's just, uh, you know, for me to go through the portal, it takes all these seconds. For the chicken to go through the portal, he literally just has to step and touch it once. Just like this, as you're gonna see, the chicken's going to try and come to me. He's gonna go through the nether portal and he's instantly in there. If you don't want chickens in your nether, if you don't want sheep in the nether, horses, all of these different types of animals, don't let them near your portal. And if you do want them, then I guess, you know, let them very deliberately near your portal or even lead them in using seeds. That's your opinion, that's your choice, I guess. By the way, you might think that flying in Minecraft is the fastest way to get around, and sometimes it can seem like it. Sometimes when you're going, uh, you know, 20 to 30 meters a second, it seems crazy the speeds that you can attain. But here's the truth. There is a faster way to get around, and that's why I built the giant boat highway, in case you're curious. Because using boats and blue ice, you can get crazy speeds. But when you compare it to a boat going on blue ice, just like this, the speed difference is absurd to say the least. Look at the speed I am going at. I'm outrunning the render distance of Minecraft, and I'm going more than double the speed of flying, and without wasting any fireworks whatsoever. 
In fact, we're gonna <laughs> collide directly with another boat, it looks like, at which point we can switch from that to change the journey. Uh, yeah, it's really crazy in my opinion that you can go this fast in Minecraft. You can travel 2,000 blocks, like I've done since I started going on these boats, in a matter of seconds, and it means that your world can be a lot better connected. So if you wanna travel far, or you just wanna travel really fast, because when the blue ice stops, it's quite fun to go flying off the edge like this, then now you know how to do that. Don't, by the way, don't leave your boats by themselves, or what might happen is a unfriendly, or maybe extra friendly guest might try and get inside the boat, and uh, although it would be fun to get inside the boat of a creeper, I'm sure you can predict the results they're gonna happen. If you can't, then there they are. A useful fact that is relevant post the aquatic update is that if you place magma below water, bubbles will appear and drag you down towards the magma. If you place soul sand below the water, then the soul sand will lift you up through the water. It's a very handy little pro tip, and you can use this, of course, to make water elevators. And you can even go a step further if you want to, and let's say you've got yourself and a creeper, or preferably without the creeper, you can actually, uh, you know, lift up boats in this same way, and you can drag boats down using the exact same methods. A useful fun fact to know is that Minecraft logic isn't necessarily perfect and that although water doesn't work inside of the nether, you can have snow here just fine, it won't melt, you can have packed ice here just fine, and you can even have blue ice here just fine, which means that yeah, you can actually combine the two previous tri uh, tips and you can have yourself a blue ice pathway going through the nether if you really want to, which means, you know how I mentioned it was pretty fast going like 70, 80 blocks a second, you can combine this with the nether and go something like 600 overworld blocks a second. I figured what could maybe be cool is if I take advantage of this and make like the nether portal which links to my ice islands also an ice island itself We'll see what we do with that. That whole project video is coming somewhat soon, by the way. If you want to learn more about my random floating ice islands I was just at. But for now, let's move on to the next thing. So you can trust ice in the nether all you like, but whatever you do, don't trust the compass, don't trust the clock. Neither of these things work because there's no such thing as time or direction in the nether. At least that's the lore explanation for these things not working. But the, what, the biggest thing of all you should never trust is the bed. Never try and sleep in the nether. Someone at some point might try and be like, Oh yeah, but you get sleeping way better or like it gives you diamonds or they'll come up with some garbage reason Here's the reason why you shouldn't sleep in the nether. You're gonna want to get some distance before you try this If you try and sleep in the nether, this happens. By the way, whenever I'm recording and something rare like this happens I feel like it's gonna take priority of the video just so I can show you one of Bedrock's weirdest exclusives That baby zombies have a tiny chance of riding any mob in the game including big zombies Which means you can get the strangest thing which is this. It is a baby zombie riding a full-size zombie or a zombie zombie a zombie jockey as a baby zombie riding a big zombie uh, You know who's got the worst deal there the big zombie or the baby zombie. I really don't know Anyway, my next pro tip is something you've got to make sure you don't do because don't stay up late at night I mean in real life too, of course like you stay up too late at night You're gonna be tired the next morning and then you're gonna uh, you know be tired all day and then stay up late at night And then you're gonna be tired the next morning It's an endless cycle that just uh, you know ends of you being tired all day every day And everyone thinks slightly less of you because they see the tired you instead of the real you But also don't stay up late in Minecraft and the reason for that is because if you stay up through three consecutive nights And I think this is gonna be our third night after this one um, after three consecutive nights of not sleeping, phantoms will start to spawn. I'm not gonna let phantoms spawn because I hate them that much. They're the worst. Make sure you don't not sleep. Yeah, make sure you go to sleep at least once every three days, even if you really don't want to, even if you need to do things at night. I always recommend waiting till the night's almost over, then getting the tiniest bit of sleep in, because in the same way that in the real world, if you don't sleep for three days at all, you'll start seeing phantoms. In Minecraft, you'll also start seeing phantoms, except the phantoms will hurt you. I guess in real life, the phantoms will hurt you too, but more like psychologically than really. What? Well, my point here is, is sleep, fellas. If, if it's midnight as you're watching this video, I give you permission. You can stop watching unless you want to learn about villages. Next up here, I have a tip relating to enchantments. So sometimes you're going to enchant something and get some really rough enchantments. Like sometimes you don't want fawns. In fact, all of the time in solo survival, you don't want fawns. It damages your armor. It's not very worthwhile having. All of the time, you don't want to have, uh, you know, for instance, fortune on a shovel. When are you ever going to use fortune too? And when you get these bad enchantments, you might think, well, that's done. Either I use the bad enchantments and just 
just don't take advantage, or I just don't use the piece of equipment at all. But there is a piece of equipment called the grindstone where you can take your shovel and you can actually disenchant it. And here's the best bit: you don't just disenchant it, you get experience back more than from the mob spawn, in fact, which means you can put that towards later enchanting this exact same shovel. Because now again, same shovel, I can now enchant with <laughs> fortune too. <laughs> you know, what? sometimes uh, life be a cruel mistress, but yeah, you can re-enchant it and uh, try and get some other enchantments if you really want to. And usually, it will be a beneficial thing, except when the game hates you, in which case, you know, sucks to be you. Let's try this again, actually. Let's, let's disenchant these leggings, just to prove. Projectile protection, I don't care about projectiles, like, skeletons are my biggest thing. Try here, <laughs> Come on, come on, game, come on. Projectile protection, I don't need any of that. So what I do instead is I put my iron leg, you know, it's a higher level of projectile protection. Is it actually? It could be that you always get the same enchantment back. Anyway though, let's go back to our village point, because I'm sure at some point in your time playing Minecraft, especially given that as of recording, the most recent update was the village and pillage update, you're gonna be interested in village trading. There's so much to be gained from trading that I could make a whole 42 things video based on that. However, for now, let's just say, you're gonna want emeralds, right? And you might think, so I could trade for emeralds and get bad trades like, oh, look, I can trade so, you know, like 10 glass for one emerald. But what if you think, nah, I'm gonna game the system. There's a way to get emeralds that isn't villagers, right? And that's true, there is a way to get emeralds that isn't inside of villagers. So yeah, if you wanna find emeralds, go to an extreme hills biome. You might say, so what's an extreme hills biome? Uh, so obviously if you're new to Minecraft and you're not familiar with these, uh, they're pretty easy to spot. They usually have extremely high hills, in fact, the, the reason they're called that is because they have extremely high hills uh, that often go way past Y100. You'll often spot snow on top of them, and they'll often have sustained peaks. A lot of biomes have small mountains that are like made of sand or grass or whatever, but extreme mountains have these or have gravel or have stone on the top. You'll spot, yeah, again, once you see them, you'll recognize them instantly, and then go within these biomes and start looking for emeralds, because as I'll show you now, so yeah, we're in a cave in an extreme hills biome right now. You'll spot them. They've got hills that are extremely tall, you could say. And if you look anywhere below an extreme hills biome, you're gonna find very quickly, oh look, there's some emeralds. And if you keep looking around, you're gonna find some really uh, you know, cool and interesting stuff. So if we dig down here, from, oh, there we go. There's more emeralds. Oh, there's more emeralds. Emeralds are the rarest ore in the game, but they're only the rarest ore in the game with the little caveat that, oh, even diamonds here too, with the caveat that in extreme hills biomes, they're actually quite common. They're only so rare because they only occur on this one biome, and realistically speaking, this isn't a great way of getting emeralds. Everyone always assumes that it is, like, wow, I can get emeralds without dealing with all this villager trading nonsense. But I mean, in, in the end, it's just like, yeah, trading with villagers will almost always be faster, but if you want to get some emerald ore, or you want to just get some emeralds of a fortune pickaxe, here's a handy way to do that. By the way, emeralds next to diamond twice in the cave, so same cave system, what a lovely little thing. The seed, if you are curious, is uh, one I've covered on my uh, channel before. You can check for the iceberg village seed if you want to check a seed that has all of this stuff on it, but realistically, you will find something like this on most seeds if you look for the extreme hills biome, which just to show you actually, like, let's show you the exact biome that we're underneath right now, so you can get a feel for like what you gotta look for to find these sorts of riches below the surface. Boom. As you can see, extreme peaks made of this bland color of grass, having some snow, some stone, and sometimes some gravel on top. However, if you are going to mine into extreme hills biome, so here's one right here you can easily spot. If you're going to mine into one, don't go to the very top and mine down like you might kind of feel from looking at that clip, always mine into the side of the mountain. Even though the mountain underground is technically underground, it's really just like a hill that means that you'll find some coal sometimes, like just over here, but you won't find anything more significant. Instead, what I always recommend is go to the edge of it and then dig your way in, kind of like make a tunnel down like this. You'll save yourself so much digging. Think about it. The Y corner up there can be twice as high as down here, so you can spend as much time as it would take me to get from here to the bottom of Minecraft just to get from there to here. And what's the point in mining, uh, you know, a giant tunnel through the mountain when you can literally just climb down the mountain side and instead make a tunnel from the mountain side all the way down to Emerald. Oh look, we literally found a cave this early. That's actually really cool. I, I, again, this is brand new unexplored cave in my Let's Play world. I'll have to check it out sometime and light it up because otherwise mobs will spawn here and it's, it'll be a whole thing. But yeah, isn't this cool? By the way, if a ghast ever takes out your uh, nether portal and you don't have a way to relight it, You've got two solutions. One is to try and get the gas to relight your portal, which in my opinion, like if you have a choice, you shouldn't do this. It's usually way more effort than it's worth. 
Like seriously, you can see it's, it's, it's not a very viable winning strategy. You're gonna get lit on fire, it's gonna hurt. Instead, one of your alternatives is to kill a Garth, because, you know, I mean, they, they took out your Nether Portal, they kind of deserve it, uh, because if you take out Garth, you'll get some Gunpowder. Then you want to take out a Wither Skeleton, because they sometimes drop coal or charcoal. All you need to find after this is a Blaze or a Blaze Spawner, which is just, I guess, a lot of Blazes in a room. But all you need to do is, uh, after this is find yourself a Blaze, kill it, get a Blaze Rod. And because of the, uh, yeah, again, this is the, this is one of my favorite recipes because it involves killing three major Nether mobs. If you kill the Blaze, if you kill a Wither Skeleton, and if you kill a, uh, you know, Ghast, you can craft something called the Fire Charge. So this is actually really handy, not just for saving yourself if you get caught in the Nether without Flint and Steel, because sometimes that happens, but also you can fire these out of dispensers and use them kind of like, you know, fire cannons if you want. So yeah, a little bit of a bonus tip right here, because I was trying to go through the Nether portal and couldn't. Fire Charges will light things right back up. And allow me to tell you about the fact that you shouldn't break your dead bushes. I've made a whole video about this, but dead bushes are basically useless, but still you shouldn't break them because once they're broken, they're gone forever. There's no way to reclaim them. This is now gone. It's removed from the world. I And although technically the world's big enough that you can keep finding more, at some point you might need dead bushes. And, you know, honestly, it's so little effort to just bring some shears, collect them anyway. Uh, but yeah, collect some dead bushes. Don't break them because you might regret it one day. And if you intend on playing Minecraft for a while. Uh, you don't want to make a decision like that. Uh, at least I don't. And the decision I do want to make is to tell you about the greatness of the Mesa Biomes. So, what's the great thing about Mesa Biomes, you might be asking? Well, the cool thing about Mesa Biomes is, uh, in the same way that Emerald Ore is insanely rare, it's the rarest ore in Minecraft, in the same way, Gold Ore is pretty hard to come by, except it's sort of not, because if you find a cave in a Mesa Biome, Mesa Biomes spawn huge amounts of gold. Seriously, gold is, uh, you know, just as common, if not more common than iron ore in these biomes. Yeah, and uh, unlike in uh, the rest of the game, uh, it's not found only below Y equals 40, it's found everywhere. You can find gold almost at the surface, and if you go to a Mesa Biome, you're gonna find a huge amount of gold. A stream I've been meaning to do for a while now is just, like, seeing how much gold I can find within, like, an hour or two hours, because, again, I don't need to tell you again, but there is a lot of gold that can be found inside one of these biomes. So keep that in mind. Or, I mean, like, don't even just keep it in mind. Just next time you're thinking, oh yeah, I need some gold. Mesa biome should be your first thought. Don't go looking around regular biomes because the Mesa biomes got you covered. And Mesa biomes are really cool biomes regardless. Like, you should want these anyway, right? By the way, in my first cave I went into, I not only found gold ore and some more gold ore, but I found a skeleton spawner. Obviously, your odds of finding one of these is not actually increased. But I mean, we can pretend it is for the sake of showmanship, right? Uh, so yeah, look at this. We've got a mob spawner. We've got this stuff going on. And uh, which, by the way, includes the name tags from earlier. Full circle, isn't that wonderful? But yeah, you can find gold ore by the mass, which is pretty cool in my opinion. And so my next pro tip is not to be fooled by the hunger bar. Unlike the armor bar and the health bar, which are linear and perfectly representative of the underlying stat, the more armor you have, the less damage you take, the less hearts you have, the less damage you can take before you die. However, the hunger bar works a bit differently. You might think that right now I have four out of 10 shanks and therefore I'm about 40% as full as I can be. But the truth is, after I eat the steak, it might seem like I've doubled my hunger, the amount of actions I can take before, you know, I start to stop. Of, but the truth is, is I've done much more than that as you're gonna see I can jump around a whole bunch before my hunger even starts going down because there is a hidden saturation bar and I don't want to do the whole deep dive into like what a saturation bar is and what that even all means in today's video but what I do want to say is that different foods have different amounts of saturation cooked beef is infinitely better than a cooked potato because it has much more saturation and uh, yeah it might seem like it's only slightly better because the game hunger value is only half the true story the rest of the story is uh, you know that there is a second value you, and that is your saturation and it's highest in the golden carrot so the golden carrot is the best food in the game despite seeming worse than cooked beef and cooked beef is better than uh, an equivalent food despite seeming about the same because saturation is a thing and you need to know that it's a thing if you want to avoid uh, embarrassing yourself or just being wrong which you know in my opinion is embarrassing yourself but maybe being wrong is a natural part of growing up but anyway let's move to the next pro tip 
Anyway, the next pro tip is regarding emeralds, because although they are best found underneath extreme hills, I never recommend that people go mining if they want emeralds. So what do I recommend instead, besides building a fascist village, but that's a, again, separate video, separate time. Uh, but uh, uh, what I actually recommend to, uh, to get emeralds is to, uh, you know, find different trades that you can easily do. One of the easiest ones you can do in any village is find a farmer villager, and they'll usually buy one of the props that they themselves grow for emeralds. So I can take 22 carrots, Side note, you'll see how in this village somewhere, there's not only wheat and potatoes, but you're gonna find carrots somewhere, although there'll also be a villager that buys potatoes. You can sell the villagers' own things back to them for a profit. It's very strange to me that they don't notice that like, oh yeah, you just happen to be selling the exact same things they're buying. But look, this guy buys literally wheat. Uh, one of the most basic resources you'll find the most common in most villages. We can go ahead and harvest all of this wheat. We probably should replant, like if you wanna be a good person. I'd recommend doing that. We can sell that and get an emerald. Isn't that crazy? I think it's crazy. We can use that same emerald to get some bread, which would be a terrible trade, to get some apples, or to get a cake if we really want to. And I think that's wonderful that you can take all of that wheat, which the villagers are growing themselves anyway, and turn it into a cake. A thing you've got to be cautious of, though, is to make sure that you never let zombies raid a village. So there are two types of uh, pillage. Uh, there are two types. So there are two types of raid you can have in Minecraft. There's a pillager raid where you bring pillagers into the village. Um, and there is also a uh, zombie raid. The zombie raid is uh, a really concerning thing because zombies on normal and hard difficulty can convert other villagers into zombies. And although this is cool for getting favors from them, whatever, uh, having your entire village die from zombies is not good because then you'll lose your progress. So yeah, don't let your village be uh, raided. Just make sure you light it up and you'll avoid that. Light up the entire area around it and you'll be mostly safe. The, the real pro tip here is though, like just go to sleep every night. I've got this nice bed over here. I sleep in the field. I look at the stars. It's a great time and it keeps my village safe. Obviously, by the way, it goes without saying don't buy 99% of the things that villager sells. Uh, even when you get to their diamond level, the maximum level a villager will sell you, they'll often try and sell you some very strange things for emeralds. So look at this, for example. Uh, I can buy a fishing rod with, what does it even have on it? I'm breaking one for six emeralds. Terrible deal. Terrible, terrible, terrible deal. Um, you know, like, I don't see why I would want that. For instance, you can buy a campfire for two emeralds. Terrible, terrible, terrible deal. 99% of the villagers offer bad deals, and that's where the stonks memes come from. Yeah, this, this meme, and, and this one too. Okay, so you, if you collect emeralds this way, you might say, so you said don't buy 99% of things. What's the point of collecting emeralds if you're not going to use them to buy things from the villagers? And this is where very specific trades come in. When you get to level 5 on a lot of villagers, you end up with some pretty good trades. So for example, this villager for 13 emeralds sells a diamond pickaxe, which I think 13 emeralds for a diamond pickaxe is actually a pretty good deal by itself, but it's 13 emeralds for a diamond pickaxe with unbreaking 3 and efficiency 2 already on there. Also, we could get a fortune made up of pods axe. I really don't want that, but I mean like, the idea that you can get really good trades, you can get potions, you can get, uh, you know, enchanted armor. You can even, if you find librarians, this is a upcoming project, if you get on uh, librarians, you can get mending books and unbreaking books on a regular schedule from librarian villages. There's so many weird, cool things you can get. It depends on what you want as to which villages be best. Like, do you want the highest level cartographer villages because you want banner patterns or you want woodland explorer maps? Uh, honestly, it depends on what you want. But the fact that every villager has their own little niche means that, yeah, look into the best trades for each villager because there are a very few, a very small, because there is a very small selection of village trades that are 100% worthwhile. So my final pro tip as to what you shouldn't do is don't walk past a million blocks or don't even get close to a million blocks in your Minecraft world. I have walked to a million before and it was an unpleasant experience just to get there. But also when, uh, again, being here is unpleasant as well. You might say, why? Well, if you look at the screen right now, this isn't me having a strange PC or whatever. This is just the downside of getting this far out. The world gets jittery, the world gets laggy. And at this stage, you can actually start to fall through the different blocks. It's somewhat hard to do, but basically because of floating points, errors, you can fall through your Minecraft world at this stage, and it's crazy if you ask me. But the fact that it's crazy doesn't stop it being possible, and yeah, basically if you get to a million blocks in any direction, the world gets worse in every way, and uh, you know, who knows if this is an issue that ever solved. 99.99% of players never come anywhere near this close, but yeah, just bear in mind you can walk this far if you want to, you can fly this far, you can do whatever you want this far, but it's gonna get less and less pleasant and more and more buggy, and just kind of don't do it. And honestly, what I would even go as far as to say, is try not to even go beyond 65,000. You'll notice 
The same thing occurs here to a much lesser extent. Uh, and also, there is a tiny chance, uh, there have been bugs before, where people can fall through the world naturally here too. It's less likely, it's significantly worse, but every time you double the block distance from the center, the world gets worse, and the place where most people are going to start sometimes noticing it is 65,000 blocks. When you get this far out, it's, it's technically 65,536, I think. It's, it's a weird specific number that will be on screen right now. But yeah, honestly, if you get this far and you're like, oh, I wish I could explore further, I mean, you can, but I would say if you really want to be on the safe side, uh, once you get to 65,000 blocks, you can kind of go back the other way and explore minus 65,000 blocks. It's just as safe that way, um, and yeah, or like just as uh, safe as in 100% safe. But yeah, if you go beyond 65,000, you're risking it a tiny bit. If you go beyond a million, you're asking to eventually fall through the world. And if you fall through the world, not only do you die, you lose all your stuff, which is unpleasant. I don't think anyone wants to lose all their stuff. My final yes pro tip here is actually related to the fact if you're going to go to dangerous places and going beyond a million blocks is actually dangerous in its own right. But if you're going to go this far, one of the things that I totally recommend is bring an ender chest along with you. So ender chests are not only useful because they kind of function like a second inventory once you break it and then pick it back up. Use a silk touch pickaxe, by the way. Uh, you can basically carry the exact same stuff around with you. But this way, if you die, especially if you die by falling through the world, all of your stuff can be stored in an ender chest. So uh, if you are going to a dangerous place, say a woolen mansion for the first time, if you've never done it, say to the end, say to anywhere like that, store your stuff in an ender chest. That way you can die, you know, come back to life and pick up all of your stuff if need be. And even if you don't die and come back to life, by having multiple ender chests, you can then, you know, keep one on you and then you can place it down and be like, oh yeah, here's all my stuff. It's a handy way to keep your stuff on you without keeping it on you in the sense of like, it's basically like a death protection uh, box where if you die, the death protection box doesn't get lost with you. Whereas, uh, you know, this this one sword that isn't in the death protection box, I need it for protection, don't get me wrong, but it also means that if I die by falling through the world or by other means, that that doesn't come with me. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Uh, also, I guess, place frequent beds and don't break the beds, because if you break your spawn point, you'll spawn all the way back at the world spawn. And if you're at a million blocks, you don't want to do that. But yeah, this was the last pro tip. I think it's weird that the video started and ended on pro tips. So I guess we didn't go for exactly 42. It's either like 39, 41, or like 43. I'd love to know which of those it is on the screen right now, Mr. Editor. But yeah, I hope you all enjoyed this video regardless. It took a long time to put together because I wanted to make sure every single pro tip was not some hypothetical. It's one that's actually helped me or actually helped subscribers in the past. And I hope you all appreciated that actual genuine knowledge. Uh, obviously, these tip videos have come a long way since the early days of my channel. And if that's something you enjoyed, please do like the video and let me know because it helps out the channel. Uh, you know, honestly, it doesn't help out the channel, but it, it lets me know that you liked it enough to not only see the video, but also to later do a thing to it. Also, if you're new around here, you can subscribe with notifications turned on because that's how you see more of these videos. If you want to learn more pro tips about different parts of Minecraft, it's what I cover every day on my channel and have done for like six or seven years now. It's a crazy amount of time. And uh, if you want to see me for another six or seven years, then hit subscribe. That's a long-term commitment, actually. You know, I'm not ready. I'm not sure if we're ready to commit to a level like that. How about we just start casually dating? You hit subscribe without the bell notifications because the bell means you see every video. Uh, subscribing is just enough, a recommendation that like, hey, sometimes I'd like to see more videos. Like, let's hang out. Let's get coffee in like a week. It'll be great. I'll, I'll look forward to doing it. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Uh, and I guess I'll see you all next time. Good. Oh, that looks really cool. Goodbye.